Hi, Ann. We're back. When we get a minute, Ann, I will introduce you to um, our GPIC. Great. Uh, chair, Sarah, and she should be on soon. And I will also introduce you to our trustees, if some of them are with us as well, and Superintendent Smith, who will do the land acknowledgement. Fantastic. And this is this is Sarah Nickel, our GPIC chair. Great Sarah, to meet you. And <laughs> Hello, thank you. Nice to meet you. I'm just going to monitor the uh, lobby here to make sure we can get as many people in. Okay. 
I believe we have almost 200 people joining us tonight. It's exciting. Wow. Very. That would be very great, yes. So when you save the recording later on, you'll have this cool montage of people's heads coming in and, you know, walking with their cats and everything. It'll be like sort of like a community building moment, right? <laughs> well, we, we Shall might I actually... go and bring my dog for a walk and put my video on? <laughs> <laughs> we it. might actually just turn off our videos um, when we're starting so that we can just have you on the screen if you're okay with that. I know it's hard to talk to just a bunch of letters. <laughs> but you know what? I'm prone to vertigo, so it's actually great if people aren't walking around making the world do this. So, yeah. Excellent. So, yes, when we do start, we'll just put you right in the center and, and let everyone else just turn their video off. <laughs> Sounds great. Now that I'm seeing other people, I kind of feel like I should have done my hair and put some makeup on. <laughs> Don't in worry about 14, it. I didn't do mine. No, that's, that's <laughs> high expectations. That's what I was thinking. I don't know who you're looking at. Not me. <laughs> in all fairness, I did just have surgery yesterday, so I'm allowed to look like <laughs> the oh, way I do. <laughs> good for you for being here. That's what I was thinking. Did we get started, Joanna, or are we? I think so. Uh, Superintendent Smith, are you with us? There, there. Okay, great. I just wanted to introduce Superintendent Smith, uh, and uh, Chair Nickel will uh, actually introduce her for our land acknowledgement. Okay. I will monitor the uh, the lobby, and I think in about what time do you have? I have six twenty nine. I have 6.32. 6.32. I think we're ready. Okay. All right. Excellent. I would like to introduce our new super, newest superintendent, uh, Superintendent April Smith, for our to read our land, land acknowledgement agreement. agreement. Thank you, land Chair acknowledgement. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Welcome, Anne. It's very exciting to be with everybody this evening. My name is April Smith. I am a cisgendered white settler. My ancestors were part of the colonization of land occupied by indigenous communities on Mother Earth from the beginning of time. My preferred pronouns are she, her, and hers. I am a partner to Chris and a mother to Summer and Gabriel. I share this information about my identities tonight as they intersect and influence my work and role as an educator and as a leader. It's easy that for me. I would like to start our meeting tonight with a land acknowledgement. The Grand Erie District School Board recognizes the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe people as the traditional peoples of this territory. We acknowledge and give gratitude to the Indigenous peoples for sharing these lands in order for us to continue our work and learning together here tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much, Superintendent Smith. Pleasure. Uh, I now have the pleasure of introducing our speaker for tonight. Um, she is the third in our series. This is the third in our series of speaker events for the month of April. And we are very pleased to have with us 
author, um, Anne Douglas. So Anne um, is a frequent contributor to CBC Radio. So my kids recognize your name from hearing it there. Um, also the author of numerous books about pregnancy and parenting. And those are books that I have on my shelves. I tried, had on my shelves. I guess my kids are older now. <laughs> um, most recently, uh, Happy Parents, Happy Kids, and Parenting Through the Storm. And is the author of The Mother of All Pregnancy Books, um, which is what I had um, when, I, when the kids were younger. Um, if you've already met Anne via one of her books, you know what you can expect from one of her presentations, to be inspired, informed, and entertained. Please join me in welcoming Anne Douglas. Oh, thanks so much, everybody. And um, does it look like we have most of our arrivees um, sort of process? Because I, I would hate to be the person in the lobby who's like running in and, you know, you miss the first few sentences. And, and or do we do you think we're in a fairly stable position in terms of people coming through? I would say we probably have um, a few more trickling in. So I will just uh, keep my eye on that. Okay. So I want to invest maybe a minute. And actually, I'm sorry, before we start to, I will let everyone know that the meeting is being recorded. Um, so we will be, we will have it available after on the GPIC site, which is accessible through the Grand Erie site. I would also ask that if everyone, I know it seems strange, I find it strange too, but if everyone could turn off their video so that we can concentrate on uh, just seeing Anne. And then at the end, um, we'll have time for a Q&A. And at that point, if you would like to ask a question, and we could see your face as well for that, or just ask it in the chat, and we can do that at that time. Yeah, that would, that would be Wonderful. great. Yeah. And just also, we have the handout PDF. And it should be, if you received an invite um, in your calendar, it should be attached there from Anne. And if you did not receive an invite and are just joining, it will also be attached to the link on the GPIC website. So thank you. Okay, well, maybe I'll just dive in and start because I'm, I'm always respectful of the time of people who are able to get here on person while also being deeply empathetic for everybody who wanted to be in here on time in person and had a family related curveball or something happened during the day because right now I feel like we're all operating with the best of intentions and sometimes our plans go a little south, right? So I'm gonna just dive in and start talking about what we're here to talk about, which is parenting in a pandemic. And I really hope because the handout is already done for you, right? Then you don't have to be sitting here feeling like you have to write anything down. Maybe this is your first opportunity today to just be able to exhale and uh, have some time for yourself, right? So parenting doesn't happen in a bubble. Parents can't help but be affected by what's going on in the wider world. So is it any wonder that right now so many parents are feeling so anxious, so guilty, and so overwhelmed? We're living through a global pandemic and we're dealing with a situation that would have felt pretty much unimaginable not that long ago. And it's pretty clear that we're gonna be dealing with this situation for a while. We've left behind our old normal and we have not yet arrived at our new normal. So our challenge right now is to figure out how to live well in this land of in-between and to help our kids to do the same. Because here's the thing, childhood is a limited time offer. We're not gonna get this time back with our kids. So we do wanna do everything in our power to make this the best experience for them and for ourselves as well as we continue to work through the remaining months, let's be optimistic and say months of the pandemic. So in terms of what I'm gonna talk about tonight, um, I'm gonna to be sharing some strategies for calming yourself so that you can in turn calm your child. I'm gonna be talking about parenting in a way that you can feel good about, not just today or this week or this month, but for many years to come while also giving yourself permission to be a gloriously imperfect parent and your child permission to be a gloriously imperfect kid. I'm going to encourage you to recognize and celebrate your many strengths as a parent <clears throat> and to celebrate the opportunity you're being given in this moment to set the emotional tone for your family. 
it really does start and end with you. And then we'll be opening up the, uh, the discussion for comments, questions, and maybe even if you just, you know, if it pops into your head while I'm talking, if you have like a word of encouragement you like, might like to offer to another parent, think about the parent who is like feeling like they're hanging on by their fingernails at this point and is wondering if they're the only person feeling this anxious, stressed, and overloaded. I can tell you because I've had a number of these conversations over the past year, you are not alone if you are that parent, and I'm sure there's other people here who will hopefully tell you the same thing during our conversation tonight. So let's dive in and talk about calming yourself. Well, the first thing I always need to say right off the top is I will never be a naturally calm person. I have to work incredibly hard at this. I tend to be a worrier. I tend to be high strung and I live with a mood disorder called bipolar disorder. So I have to work really hard to regulate my emotions or I can just be like a human stress ball, right? However, I have learned over the years that calm is our parenting superpower. When we are able to get to that place of calm, it improves the quality of our thinking. We're able to make more conscious and deliberate parenting choices, and we're less likely to say or th do things that we might regret. We also have the opportunity to, to model this state of calm for our kids because their self-regulation skills are still under development. They're still learning how to manage like these very big feelings. And in terms of uh, getting to this place of calm, I think it's important to recognize just how hard our brains have been working and will continue to work as we try to think our way out of the pandemic. I mean, for the past over a year, our brains have not just been focused on what it is we're doing in the here and now, whether that's like writing an email or making dinner, but also working away in the background on all those pandemic related worries. And there's just layers of layers of those at any given time. So when our brain is doing this, it's multitasking. It's switching from making dinner to thinking about vaccinations and wondering about the health of this family member and, and so on and so on, right? Just layers and layers. So if your brain feels maxed out, it's certainly for good reason. Uh, you've been carrying around a really heavy load and you've been carrying it around for a very long time. Now, in terms of getting to that place of calm, what can we do to maybe just feel a little bit calmer a little more often? That's the standard I set for myself, and that's like absolutely the most I can ask of any other human being. One strategy is to take stock of all the coping strategies you've learned over the years and to zero in on the strategies that work best for you personally. For some people, it's reaching out to others for emotional support or spending time in nature, or doing some kind of physical activity, or doing something creative, or maybe some combination of all of those different things. You know yourself best, so you know what has worked well for you in the past. And while you're at it, don't forget to give yourself credit for all the coping skills you've developed over the course of the pandemic. Uh, it's important to do this because instead of seeing yourself as helpless or out of control or at the whim of the pandemic, you can suddenly see yourself as a person with agency and strategies for managing the elements of this thing that are still within your control. I often think about how shocked 2019 me would be if she bumped into 2021 me on the street. The earlier me would say, what do you mean you've lived through a global pandemic for a year and you're like you're you're coping, you're managing the anxiety ride that is the daily news. Uh, you, you've managed to do all these things to keep yourself and other people safe. Like I'm blown away. I'm so impressed with you. I think we sometimes forget to give ourselves credit for all the learning that's happened during this time. Our flexible thinking skills, the number of times we've had to pivot and change course our patience and our ability to just uh, carry a really heavy emotional load. And if you're able to recognize these strengths, suddenly they become a resource for you to tap into during the months ahead. In terms of getting to that place of calm, we can also make a conscious effort to focus our attention in ways that leave us feeling happier and less stressed. Because Here's a lesson I have to relearn on a regular basis. There's a difference between being informed 
and being immersed in the news. Some days are really hard. I think last Friday, the entire province was in news overload mode, trying to figure out what was happening next. And it's easy to get caught into a cycle of doom scrolling, where you just keep going from one bad news headline to the to the next. And I get it. Like, you know, we want to know what we need to know to keep our families safe. But there's a point where I think we go too deep into that research and then it's hard to ever relax or even to sleep well through the night. The number of people who've told me about and I include myself in this group, COVID related dreams over the past year, like it's it's quite clear that we're getting a lot of COVID content. So we have to balance that out, I think, by feeding our brains other types of information. And you find some of these stories in the, the media that offer some kind of message of hope or connection or, you know, just something non-COVID related, just to, you know, to give you a little bit of variety. I also like to spend a lot of time reading novels because that can transport me to another time and place where there isn't COVID. And I know some people are writing sort of pandemic fiction. That will not be my relaxation reading anytime soon. But if it works for you, please go there, right? We can also work at becoming comfortable with feelings of, of uncertainty. I think that that was the hardest thing of the early months of the pandemic, just not knowing what was going on or what was going to happen next. And now we've had a year of practicing this skill of managing the, the uncertainty. Doesn't mean it's easy, but at least we're getting good at it, right? Because even though we would love to be able to use our wonderful planning brains and to be able to say to ourselves, well, I just have to come up with a game plan. If this happens, I'll do this. If this happens, I'll do that. In a pandemic, there's like 8,000 variables in play in every moment. You cannot think your way through a pandemic just by you know, mentally processing it one piece at a time. There are just too many elements in play. So sometimes we do have to say to ourselves, you know, I'm focusing on this little thing in this moment and that's all my brain can process right now. It helps also to remind yourself that yes, a lot of things are out of our control, but many things are still within our control, maybe elements of our daily routine or the thinking that happens in our own head, because we can either focus on feeling like everything's out of control or we can take back a sense of our own agency. We can also learn strategies for hitting the brakes on unproductive worry where you just are basically spinning your worry wheels and not making any progress. <laughs> Last week I was out for a walk. I live in a rural area and there was this um, fellow who clearly wasn't used to springtime driving in rural areas and he decided to drive his truck off the road into what at this time of year is not just a nice patch of grass, but actually is a little bit of a swamp. And he realized almost right away that he'd made a mistake. And then he panicked and he started hitting the accelerator and literally spinning his wheels. He did this for 20 minutes until he basically had bottomed out his truck and had to call a tow truck to, to get him out. But that's sometimes what we can do with our worry. Instead of saying, okay, I am worried about this and the action I need to take to ease some of that worry is this, we just get stuck in that emotional mud. Um, and sometimes we don't have a solution to a particular problem. So the best thing to do then is to say to yourself, I've thought about this for a while. I've given myself like a 30 minute worry budget. I'm not making any progress on this, so I am parking this worry until tomorrow or next week or whatever is realistic and possible. I think I'm hearing audio in the background there, and I'm not sure if other people are as well. Yes. I will keep going and just assume that my lovely suite of tech people will do their magic in the background. So um, another thing about worrying is sometimes we actually team up with somebody else who manages to intensify our worries where, uh, you know, let's say that I'm worried about this thing and you come in and you go, oh, yeah, I'm worried about that, too. And you know what? It could be even worse. And then you amplify my worry and then I build on yours and we just basically make life so much more difficult for ourselves. So I think we have to be sometimes alert to the possibility that that could be happening and then back out of the worry together. Say, you know what? I think this conversation is taking us to a dark place. Let's refocus. And this can be really helpful to do 
with a child who's naturally anxious. And we'll be talking more about that in a moment because a lot of kids are struggling with a lot of anxiety. And the final thing I would say in terms of calming yourself is how important it is to find a way to make peace with whatever decisions you've been asked to make for yourself and your family over the course of the pandemic. I often think back to last summer when parents were being asked to make like really impossible choices those who even had the choice of what to do about virtual learning versus in-school learning. It's not like there was one clear, obvious, superior choice. People were balancing and projecting and trying to figure out like what is the best path forward for my child in this moment. And it makes me sad when I sometimes hear parents in like now, like in April, thinking, well, if I'd known things were gonna play out this way, I might've made a different choice. You had no way of knowing. You didn't have a crystal ball in August that would tell you what the next six to eight months were going to be like. So you made the best decisions you could with the knowledge and information you had at the time. And really, if you think about it, isn't that all we can reasonably ask of ourselves? I think asking ourselves of anything of anything more than that is actually quite unfair. So we've been talking up until now about calming you. Now let's talk about calming your child. I think a really key point is to do whatever you can, as much as you can, to maintain the reassuring rhythm of daily living. We humans are creatures of habit. We love our rituals. We love our routines. Some in my family might say, I love my ruts. I'll own it. Uh, we just like that element of the predictable. And at a time when so much is unpredictable, that can really be reassuring. Like think about little things, right? Like if you get up in the morning and you discover that the milk in the fridge has gone sour or you ran out of tea, that's not a great way to start your day, right? And this, uh, this applies for children as well. They do really like to know that the things they count on to feel happy, comforted, and even just loved, that those fundamentals are in place. We can also help our kids to talk about whatever it is they're feeling and to let them know that those feelings make sense. I mean, it's magical to have somebody validate your feelings for you. Just say, yeah, it makes sense that you're feeling so anxious right now because there has been a lot to worry about. We're all feeling that in a, in a really big way and also giving them the message that there's no such thing as a wrong or a bad emotion. Uh, so if they say something like, I hate the stupid pandemic and I'm sick and tired of everybody in this family. You don't have to judge them for having those feelings. You can just say like, it's been a, a really long, hard pandemic. You know, you don't have to agree that they want to, uh, you know, disown their brother or something like that, but you can certainly uh, endorse the underlying emotion, which is a lot of people are really fed up at this point in the pandemic. And Understand that even very young children who might not necessarily have the vocabulary to pinpoint the exact emotion, like even just like babes in arms and toddlers, they will be so comforted just by your reassuring presence. So your body language, your tone of voice, your sense of calm, your the message that you're giving all of your kids that I'm the grown up and I can carry a lot of these worries for you that is tremendously reassuring for a child. I often think about um, when September 11th happened and I was not a young child when September 11th happened, but the first thing I did was phone my dad uh, and say, is everything gonna be okay? I just really wanted that reassurance. So I often think about kids now just looking to us, the grownups for some sense of safety and control. So what do you do about that kid who's being really, really quiet? Uh, you have a sense that they're quite worried or they're quite frustrated, but they aren't putting those emotions into words. It can be helpful to talk a little bit about how you're feeling, because when you do that, uh, you give your child the message that this is the kind of family where we talk about our emotions. And of course, you don't want to be like the parent who forgets that they're the grown up and says, you know, actually, I'm really worried about my job and the mortgage and, you know, paying our rent this month. Like you don't want to give little kids a lot of grown up worries, but you can say today I woke up in a really grumpy mood and I'm not quite sure why I'm feeling grumpy. Let me talk that through with myself and, you know, just share some of that modeling of skills. 
And you can also, even if they aren't opening up about their emotions, you can start conversations about how other people are feeling. Like, I heard from one of your cousins and this is going on in their life. Like, they're really missing their friends. They're feeling really frustrated that we're in another lockdown situation. That might encourage your child to be forthcoming. Or sometimes just roll their eyes and sit in silence, but at least you've put all of those conversation elements out into the world. And you never know when it's gonna, when the conversation will suddenly resume. I used to find that whenever I was exhausted and ready to go to bed, like 10.30 or 11 o'clock at night, that's when my teenagers in particular would decide they wanted to have a two hour conversation. And sometimes you just have to seize the moment because it really is a golden opportunity when that happens. We can help kids to focus on what is known as opposed to feeling overwhelmed by what isn't known and to help them to give themselves credit for all the flexible thinking that they've exhibited over the past year. Like, I am so impressed by what kids and young people have been able to do, like all the sacrifices they've made all the caring they've shown and all the things they've been willing to do to keep themselves and other people safe. And sometimes I think people are really hard on kids. I think that we hear in the media sometimes, you know, the exception of the story when a young person made a bad choice and frankly look back in, you know, in time and maybe you made a bad choice once when you were a teenager too. But I think for the most part, Teenagers are, are trying so hard to, uh, you know, to be responsible community members, and they've done a pretty incredible job. In terms of um, the hard questions, right, a lot of worries come out and it's like, when is this pandemic going to be over? Will we be able to have a normal summer? Will we be able to, you know, to go see some of the people we haven't seen in a year? You don't have to have the answers to those questions which is a good thing because nobody has the answers to those questions yet. So you can be honest with your child and say, we really don't know yet, but here's what we're hoping and here's what we're thinking. And we can make some tentative plans, not necessarily like booking travel where you have to fork out money, but having a rough plan on a piece of paper that when we can go away for a weekend, guess what we're doing first, that kind of thinking. It's important in terms of sort of keeping the sense of calm in both your child and yourself to not allow yourself to be triggered by any super annoying behaviors your child might be exhibiting right now. Instead of getting angry, try to remind yourself that behavior is communication and ask yourself, what does my child really need from me right now? An angry outburst might mean I'm really, really anxious or I'm fed up or I'm exhausted. It can be helpful to tune into sort of some of the unsaid things, like if you notice your child is having a lot of headaches and stomach aches, or you're noticing changes to their eating habits, sleeping habits, physical activity level, their overall energy level or mood. You have spent like years, if not decades of your life getting to know this young person and so you are like the world's leading expert on this particular kid so if your parent radar is saying something is a little off with my child pay attention i would look for uh, a sudden change in behavior that seemed quite dramatic and worrisome but i would also pay attention to i can't remember the child the last time my child was happy like life shouldn't be this difficult when you're a kid i would pay attention to sort of things on both ends of that spectrum and i should mention that i have four kids they're now between the ages of 23 and 33 um, but when they were younger they had a lot of struggles i'm talking mental health neurodevelopmental behavioral challenges um, a learning disability all four of them have adhd and my youngest is on the autism spectrum so i know that sometimes disruption of routine is a huge deal for some kids and they just can't cope. So, you know, getting some extra support for them and for you is always helpful, I find. So how do you tap into this support? All kinds of different ways. You could touch base with your child's teacher or the school and find out what supports are available either at the school level or behind the scenes at the board. You could touch base with the family doctor you could look on the Children's Mental Health Ontario website, that's cmho.org, 
And that's a great clearinghouse of information about um, publicly funded children's mental health services in the province. And there's a mix of support for parents and clinical services for children. So a good place to start if you're just sort of feeling like you need to, to you know, run some parenting strategies through another person. You can also help your child to understand that reaching out to other people for support is like what we're wired to do as humans, right? It's not a sense of a, a source of weakness, it's a source of strength. A couple of years ago, I was researching my book, Happy Parents, Happy Kids, and I came across this study that I think about almost every single day. And what this group of psychologists discovered is that when we t turn to other people for support, we actually have the ability in our bodies to anticipate that support at a biological, physical level. It's quite incredible. What they did was they took a bunch of university students on a hike. Poor university students, eh? They get to be the guinea pigs in all the experiments. But anyways, they took some of them on a walk by themselves, and they took other ones on a walk where they were in a group or in pairs. And they found that if you were one of the kids who was walking with a buddy, the backpack you were carrying didn't feel as heavy and the slope of the hill didn't seem as steep as it did if you were somebody who was walking on their own. So, so quite incredible that our bodies actually say, hey, I'm walking with this other person. I guess if I get really tired, my buddy might carry my backpack for me. Like just incredible that that's actually a biological calculation. In terms of parenting in a way that you can feel good about and that will actually strengthen the relationship with your child, I find it really helpful to focus on my big picture parenting goals. And by that, I mean my hopes and dreams for my child, myself and my family for many years to come. I find it helpful to have like a mental picture that I carry around. And for years, for me, it's been I want to be the kind of family where the kids actually want to come home for the family reunion. And we did terribly last year, right? I could only see one out of the four kids over the course of the entire pandemic. But in pre-pandemic times, we actually had a pretty good track record of the kids wanting to get together as a family. And so that's my very personal picture. And you might have something different. But if you have some kind of vision of the future of where you, you and your kids are going to end up, that can help you to make more conscious and deliberate choices in the moment. Because you might say to yourself, I'm totally frustrated, but if I say this thing, is that going to actually build on our, our connection and our relationship, or is that going to just put distance in the relationship and get both of us feeling angry and, and unhappy? I also think it's worth reminding ourselves and thinking about the fact that um, this is going to be a formative uh period in the lives of our children, like the memories they take from this moment, the stories they have to tell, those are stories they're going to be talking about for the rest of their lives and telling their grandchildren. So we want our kids to come from through the pandemic with a mix of different kinds of worries. Like sure, there will be strange memories of the early days when everybody was freaking out and hoarding toilet paper, but hopefully there's also some fun and joyous memories to balance out the incredible sadness because a lot of us at this point know people who either were in our immediate circle or a little removed who lost their lives during the pandemic. So there's also a lot of sadness and grief and trauma happening as well. So focus on the relationship, that lifelong bond that you've been trying to build with your child since day one. Because if our kids are able to come out the other side of this crisis feeling loved and supported by their parents and mastering some all important coping skills, I honestly feel like the, the really important learning, the life learning that happens during this time will have been massive. As parents, we can also learn about child development so that we can parent in a way that brings out the best as opposed to the worst in our child. Uh, if you have a child who is uh, not neurotypical, it's really important to have sort of developmentally appropriate expectations of what is this kid capable of at this point in time, as opposed to steady, setting the expectations impossibly high for that kid, because that's stressful for them and it's stressful for you as too, as well. It's also really important to understand that there are basically three ingredients in the recipe for great parenting. 
The first is giving kids a message of unconditional love and approval. The idea being that you don't have to do or say anything to earn my love. You've already earned it for a lifetime just by virtue of being you. And that's such a powerful thing. That's so much what I think we all crave in our daily lives, even as adults. The second ingredient is warm, sensitive, and responsive parenting. Uh, psychologists often refer to it as serve and return parenting, almost like we're playing a tennis game and I'm bouncing the ball to you and you can tell I'm not a great tennis player and you're like lobbing it back at me and we're anticipating one another's body movements and we're sort of like really in the zone of being tuned into one another. That's what the really magical moments of parenting are like. Now, sometimes when I say this, I can see people's guiltometers lighting up, right? It's like, do you, do you think that it's possible to do this all the time? Of course it is not. It, it would not be possible to make dinner or buy groceries or do any of the other things you have to do in your life if you had to have that kind of total tuned in focus. But we want those little moments of connection because it feels great to our kids. And you know what? It feels great to us as well. Think back to when you were first thinking you wanted to become a parent. That's the kind of stuff you dreamed of. Like that's the TV commercial you had in your head of like, you know, jumping and bouncing on a bed and laughing and reading stories together. Or, you know, you don't want to rob yourself of that because that's the reward of parenting. It makes up for all the other hard work. And the third ingredient in that recipe for great parenting is support for your child's growing independence and emerging sense of autonomy. Psychologists call this autonomy supportive parenting. Uh, and basically it means that you're figuring out how much freedom your child can handle without sort of overshooting in either direction, giving them too much or too little freedom. Again, this is like, a process of experimentation because every child is different and children don't develop in sort of like some nice linear predictable way. Uh, it's more of a meandering. So there'll be times when you overshoot in both directions and then you change and correct course. But that's one of the rules of parenting is just to sort of support, encourage and, you know, keep your little baby bird from falling out of the nest. I don't know. So that's sort of like the, the theory part of good parenting. Now I want to remind you that this is not supposed to be an exercise in you know guilt. It's not a guilt master class to make sure you feel guiltier at the end of the evening than you did when you started. No. So I want to remind you what I said at the at, right at the get go that I want you to give yourself permission to be a gloriously imperfect parent and your child permission to be a gloriously imperfect kid. Parents don't have to be perfect and neither do kids. We can learn and grow together. So I always say think progress, not perfection. And especially in a pandemic, you're under so much stress. You're going to say and do things you might regret. The good news is that you can recognize when this has happened and then you can pivot to doing relationship repair. Sometimes parents are worried about apologizing for something they've done that was a mistake because they're worried that they're going to lose credibility with their kids. Well, a couple of years ago, I, I wrote a whole column on this and I took a deep dive into the research on parental apologies. And the researchers found that actually when you apologize to your child, you become more credible with that child and your child feels more connected. They take your apology as evidence of parental love. So it's really a magic and lovely thing and we all need to do them, right? In terms of minimizing some of that parental guilt, which I have to say at this point in the, in the pandemic is crushing for a lot of parents, it's helpful to know that it's not fair to yourself to keep your expectations sky high when the resources you have at your disposal are much lower than they were pandemic, but pre-pandemic, like before the pandemic, you had schools and childcare and extracurriculars and nice neighbors who would have your kid over to play. And so you, you felt much more supported as a parent. I mean, it wasn't paradise, but it was a lot easier, right? So a lot of those supports and resources have dropped away. So it's really not fair to you to expect to be able to hold yourself to like pre-pandemic parenting standards. So I would just say, look for opportunities to like, you know, ease up on yourself a little bit. Just be kind to yourself about some of that kind of stuff. And while you're at it, 
maybe talk about modifying the expectations that other people are putting on you. Um, I've heard of stories of wonderful employers and terrible employers, wonderful employers who have given their, their employees the message that we will work with you because we know you're trying to clone yourself and be a, a teacher and a parent and an employee and all of these things all at once. And that's just like not possible. It's like, it would be like quadrupling or whatever yourself. Like you just don't have that many resources. And then I've heard of other employers who are actually being really unfair. Somebody I know had a performance review done recently and um, their performance dri dropped during the pandemic. Like somehow in their workplace, they they measure like units of productivity, which doesn't make a huge amount of sense to me. But anyways, like who holds somebody to pre-pandemic standards in a pandemic? Totally unfair. This may be why I've been a self-employed author my whole life. I guess I wouldn't cope well with corporate culture. But I just wanted to say like, join forces with other people in your workplace and have conversations about the fact that everybody is having a hard time. Because if you're feeling like it's just you and your coworkers feeling like it's just them, everybody's feeling guilty and terrible when really it's not an individual issue at all. It's a collective challenge that we're facing at the society level. So anyways, I could go down that rabbit hole for a while, but I think you get the, the general sense that, you know, really, do not be unreasonable in your um, expectations of yourself. Practice self-compassion. I've alluded to this a couple of times and people might not know exactly what self-compassion is, but self-compassion is basically treating yourself with at least as much kindness as you would extend to a friend who's struggling. So if you had a friend who said to you, you're gonna think I'm the worst parent in the world, you wouldn't be very much of a friend if you agreed with them and said, well, you kind of are. And yet sometimes we will be that harsh and judgmental to ourselves and it's just not fair. So what you should do is turn that around and think about the words of comfort and encouragement you would offer to that friend if they, you know, if they sent you a text message and said that and you would probably type something really kind back. So be that friend to yourself. And if you need a little phrase to sort of tattoo in your brain, I'm going to tell you the one that has served me well through house fire and all kinds of other challenging situations. And that is, I'm doing the best that I can in a really difficult situation, period. You know, no guilt. Okay, we're heading into the home stretch now, but just wanted to touch on a couple of quick points. First of all, the importance of recognizing and celebrating your many strengths as a parent. At the get-go, we talked about uh, acknowledging your coping skills. Now I want you to take it one step further and think about the words that somebody who knows you as a parent and deeply appreciates the kind of parent you are, what words would that person use to describe you? Maybe they'd say you're patient or funny or high energy or resourceful or any number of other things. Because I want you to write down those words and recognize that those are the strengths you can continue to build on during the remaining months of the pandemic. I also want to remind you that you have the opportunity to set the emotional tone for your family. There are things you can do to help yourself and your kids to feel happier and calmer, even if our pandemic related worries aren't about to disappear anytime soon. It can be a matter of knowing when you're getting stuck in a bit of a negative thinking rut and deciding to make a conscious effort to balance that out with moments of, you know, wonder, awe, gratitude. The world is awakening. It's a beautiful time of year. Yes, I know we had snow this week. That was just a bad joke on behalf of Mother Nature. But in general, the lakes have thawed. It's beautiful outside. Losing yourself in some of that sense of awe and moments of meaning and connection and purpose, really reflecting on the ways you have over the past year been a wonderful community member who's done everything in your power to take care of other people. Really lean into that emotion and allow it to make you feel less alone and so valued by the people around you. Finally, remind yourself that you are the key ingredient in the recipe for your child's resilience. 
The research on what allows children to thrive when they come through natural disasters or wartime or any other kind of emergency situation is crystal clear. It's having at least one caring adult in your world who helps you to feel safe. That's what ultimately allows children to come through challenging times and you have the opportunity to be that safe place and that safe person for your child. Thank you. And now I think we'll open it up for questions and comments. And as the lovely hosting team said earlier on, uh, we're fine with people popping up on camera or unmuting their audio or typing a question or comment into the, the, you know, the chat box. Whatever you feel comfortable with will work brilliantly for us. So I'm going to let the team sort of facilitate things behind the scenes because the technology is not necessarily my strength and I don't want to push the wrong button. So you guys work your magic and I'll just answer questions as people pop up. Thank you so much, Anne. And we will thank you at the end. We'll give everybody a, a few minutes. And again, if you'd like to pop up on the screen, please do so. We invite you and otherwise we will keep our eye on the chat and we'll read those questions out to you. It's always a bit intimidating being the first person to ask a question. So maybe I'll just chime in and say often um, people want to talk about screen time. I don't think I've been to a single conversation in the past year where parents aren't feeling guilty. So we can talk about that. But I see Jessica already has her hand up. So why don't we go to Jessica's question and Perfect. if we get a lull, we can talk screen time. Wonderful. Go ahead, Jessica. You were mentioning Jessica, we actually lost you. You had something about your messaging. I don't know if it's your connection. Hi, Jessica, do you want to try to maybe put it in? There we are. OK, how about if we go to Peter and then we'll come back to Jessica? Oh, OK, oh, I guess I'm popping up as Peter. It's my husband's <laughs> laptop. <laughs> um, so I kind of had a question. A lot of the extracurricular activities now are offered online. For example, my daughter's um, dance class is offering it online. And I'm a little concerned with her you know, online school and then they have online dance and then they want to be online talking to their friends and doing video games and all the other stuff that they wanted to do online, like after schools or on the weekends. It's kind of hard to limit that. Um, I don't know. I, I, I guess what I'm trying to ask is like, what's a good balance? Like I, I kind of told my daughter, you know, if she doesn't feel like doing the online dance, I kind of don't even want, I just don't want her to be online all day, every day. Yeah. Um, but then taking away the curricular activities or telling her, yeah, it's okay. You don't have to do it. I mean, is, is that good or bad? Yeah. Like, I, I, I don't yeah, I don't think there's any magical answer. Um, what I have been sort of like trying to think through and process is um, back in pre-pandemic times, everybody was really crystal clear on, you know, you should only have a couple of hours of recreational screen time and so on. And then the world shut down. And so now um, our screens are learning devices and portals to the outside world. They're the way we connect with our friends. And as you just noted, like it's the way kids do their sports or whatever activities. So I would say that you probably want to um, recognize that there will be a lot more screen time than usual, but you also want to get your daughter to, to, to sort of notice um, when it's too much for her, because it can be like a really individual thing. Like if she's having a hard time winding down in the evening because she feels like her brain is completely wired, then that's too much screen time. And maybe the, uh, you know, the online dance class may or may not be a positive thing. And um, but on the other hand, if that's how she hangs out with her her dance team friends, then it's hard to lose that connection. So I think like we just need to get away from all or nothing thinking like maybe she goes sometimes and maybe she doesn't go other times. And, you know, just like some days 
children need to take like a mental health day because they've just reached their wits end. Like, I don't think that thinking of everything as like, yes, no, on, off is helpful. And I'm not saying you were thinking that, but I think that just some of our formulas that, that we carried over into the pandemic can sometimes make us feel like there's a right or a wrong answer. And the answer to so many things right now is it depends or um, what will work for you or what will work for you today. <laughs> So it's probably the most wishy-washy answer you've ever heard to a question in your life, but I try to be honest and keep it real. Okay, um, I just have a, um, another question too. She, so my daughter seems to be more eager to do her online schoolwork in the evenings. Um, I kind of worry about that because it changes her whole schedule and her whole routine. She does does seem to be mo more focused in the evenings rather than in the mornings. It's really hard to get her motivated to do the work when she's supposed to be doing it. Um, should I just let her do it whenever? Is she, she a teenager it? or? Uh, she's 11. 11 right. going on 16. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. So heading into that stage where they sort of tend to become night owls. So I think when um, when some of the school people pop back on again, I'll let them answer that because that seems to me like an excellent educator question. Okay, thank you. That's great, Anne. Um, again, I don't know if we want to go to the side chat here and then we can we can probably go back. Um, and I'll see if uh, we have some educators online. I can I could definitely add to that uh, just from a, a, a general uh, point of view. I think you always have to know your household and how things work and how really uh, you can support your your child um, and what their motivation level is and 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 why is it now that she may want to do her work in the evening uh, versus the day and, and how does that look in terms of synchronous versus asynchronous so if you can balance and sort that out it could be another uh, way of looking at things so we have two other questions here in the chat okay the first is i have an 18 year old daughter uh, with severe with severe anxiety who loves to be out doing things as we all would i'm sure and being with friends this has been so difficult for her. How can I support her? Yeah. Yeah, I think the biggest thing is just to let her know, like to validate what she's feeling. And it can be sometimes painful as a parent because your child is like pouring out their heart. And, you know, there's that temptation to want to um, make things better and say, oh, you know, it'll be better soon. Or, you know, it could have been worse. You know, this thing could have happened. But really, all they want you to say is, yeah, it really, really is hard. It is so frustrating. It's so disappointing. And then when you get to a certain point with validating somebody's emotions, they typically then you can almost see like there's like they take a breath. And at that point, they're able to start sort of, you know, brainstorming some solutions and that means like identifying what's the underlying issue here like is it the loneliness is it worrying about friends you know forgetting about her like what is the underlying worry and then what could you do to address that and uh you know i mean i I find this even as like an adult, like it is really hard work to maintain friendships right now. And I've had a lot of Zoom calls with some of my own girlfriends, but there are some days everybody's so exhausted and so sick of screens that it's hard to have those moments of connection. So maybe a short, meaningful conversation as opposed to trying to hang out with your best friend every day when you have nothing to talk about, that kind of, you know, ebb and flow so I think just really letting her know that you you get it, you care, and uh, you know you also trust her to have the creativity to think of some temporary, even though probably not ideal solutions. Really keeping it real and just truckloads of empathy. Thank you, Anne. Our next question: How do I handle the ongoing? Oh, sorry, I might have missed one here. I apologize. We have a 16 year old son who was diagnosed with bipolar disorder um, two this past summer. How do we support him the best way? His medication has helped him a lot, but uh, it's not being able to be with his friends and it's been really incredibly difficult with him and his moods and anxiety. Yeah, 
Yeah, I think, again, really acknowledging the struggle and validating the emotions. And I think with a, a young person who has a new diagnosis, it's so important to help them to put that in context. Like, I remember one of my kids after he um, got his autism diagnosis saying to me, I guess I'm your most defective kid. And that just broke my heart. And I had to say, it's not that at all. All it is, is just like I've had to learn strategies for managing my bipolar polar disorder. It's about figuring out the strategies that will let you still have a really great life. Like you can have a mental illness and you can have a great life. You don't have to choose one or the other, but there's like that learning curve. I imagine it's like when people are diagnosed with diabetes, you have to figure out how to get your body systems to work and how to use the technology and support of your health goals. It's the exact same thing with a mood disorder. But of course, the pandemic makes it 10,000% more challenging. So I think just keeping that big picture goal in mind, your goal is for your child to be able to have a happy life and function well, uh, you know, coming out the other side of the pandemic and through the rest of their life. So what are you going to do to build in that direction? Letting your child know that they don't have to figure out all these mental health strategies on their own, that, you know, there are other people who can support them in this, in the family, in other supports behind the scenes. And above all, I remember a couple of times various kids saying, like, this family would be so much better without me. It's like, no, you know, we love and value you and we're part of Team U. Like, we are here to help support you in your learning and growth and getting through right now a really really challenging time so so I'm sorry you're dealing with that added challenge because heaven knows parenting in a pandemic is enough without adding on a new diagnosis on top of it thank you once again Anne. and we have a couple more questions here um, and I just want to gauge our time too. So uh, I'll, I'll just uh, monitor, oh, we have three here. How do I handle the fight between my team and I going on to hang out with his friends because everyone's parents um, <clears throat> except his are letting them out? Yeah. Do, do I just use that acknowledge, uh, acknowledging of feelings uh, technique so that we aren't having a disagreement every night? Start with that and also even back in like, you know, prehistoric times when I was a young parent, we had to have this really super annoying conversation about other families' rules. Like in our family, the rule is this and that other family's decided to do it this way. And I think what makes it right hard right now is there's so much judging of other people. Like our family made this choice and those people made that choice and either they're wrong or we're wrong. And it's not necessarily that black and white. Like, you know, we might not understand or agree with everything that's happening at their house and vice versa. So I think it helps to sort of reconnect with your family's values of what you why you're making the decision sharing that thinking as a parent like the health unit is saying that this is the best advice so we're following that and this is actually an act of caring for other people i know you find it super annoying but i couldn't live with myself if we did something in our family that caused another family's grandparent or or you know young child to become ill with this terrible disease so this these are the choices that we're making and then again let's get creative and figure out what is reasonable and possible you know with some of the research on outdoor uh, get togethers after we're out of this like really lockdown period maybe we can start making plans and dreams for what might be possible even like a month or two from now this is the really hard time I think like April has felt like the worst month and it, it it just has been really crushing for a lot of people so I think we have to look forward to brighter days ahead as more people are vaccinated as we have the great weather again and as we hopefully you know break the flipping curve this time I don't even want to bend it I want to stomp it in into the ground so thank you Anne the next question we have here is can you comment on how to manage rules within your oops it's moving here on me <laughs> in your own home versus rules within other families i.e not allow uh, allowing play dates and sleepovers when others are it's difficult to make decisions to keep kids safe but also allow them to develop socially any strategies things yeah. to save your kids 
Yeah, I think just um, that's pretty similar to the last yes. question. So yes. I would just, yeah, I would just reiterate just that sharing your values and your thinking. And it doesn't mean they're going to say, oh, great. Now that you explained that so brilliantly, I totally support your parenting and I'm completely compliant. There will still be tears. There will still be rage. But at least, you know, in a grudging way, they'll know that you're doing this with their best interests and the best interests of other people in mind, even if they don't say thank you for another decade, because there can be a little bit of a lag in the appreciation department at times. And we just have a comment to say thank you for your insight. We definitely need to reflect. This is from Deborah and focus on what has been working for us as individual families and take that time to listen to our children and find that balance to make it through this pandemic. Great advice. And Jessica, we have you back. So that's great. Uh, Jessica, I will uh, read your question out. How do I help my son who cannot stay focused? He thinks school is boring. He would rather play games online. Another factor for him was that the fact that he has seven different teachers. He does not take uh, change too, too well. He is seven. He is not diagnosed, but I feel he may be uh, ADD slash ADHD. And I'm trying, but I need help to help him. Yeah. My best advice would be to be like completely honest with the teacher, the principal, any all the support staff at the school who are there to help in situations like this and let them know like this is the challenge that we're dealing with on the ground and what is your best advice given what you're seeing with other kids um, because it's not just your child like virtual learning is really challenging for certain kids and uh, and every family situation is different like I know one family in another province where um, one of the parents has basically had to like put her other work on hold so she can actually like keep her child focused. But not every family has the ability to do that or and not every parent in the world has the patience to do that. Like there's just so many different variables. So I think strategizing with the school and figuring out like, um, you know, we're probably going to have a, a challenging school year next year. So maybe even just planning ahead for fall, what could we do to make the, the path into the next school year um, as stress-free as possible and not to choose this kid to sort of get so fed up with learning that they lose that enthusiasm for learning? Because I think that it's the broader learning, emotional, um, you know, kids doing well and feeling good about school goals that have to be the priority when there are so many short term challenges and um, getting any assessments done behind the scenes. I realize it's pretty challenging to sort of go through the assessment process in a in a um, a pandemic, but just at least get the wheels moving in that direction, because I know at one point it took us quite a while to to work through that whole process. I, I've been working with his teachers, every single one as they changed, and even talking to the homeschool and stuff like that, and nobody can, there's, they try and say, okay, we'll just keep an eye on him, that's about it, yeah. and it's just, it's, it's hard to get him to, you know what I mean? Totally get it, I mean, all four of my kids have ADHD, and uh, I have no doubt that the wheels would have come off the bus in our family if we had been pan parenting through the pandemic. Just knowing the challenges with two of the kids in particular, it would have been, uh, you know, the flipping screen thing. I would have thought they were doing their schoolwork. I would have blinked and then there would have been like another screen actually in play. So like the, the challenge is real. And um, I would suggest seeing if like the people at the school could connect you with other people at the board level or in the community or other sort of like even just like the local learning disabilities association we um had one of our kids do like a learning skills course that was really helpful to him in organizing and setting learning goals for himself that sounds way too corporate I, I hate that lingo but just basically taking charge of his own learning and identifying strategies that would work for him so that's what i would suggest Okay. And I'm sure you're dealing with that frustration because you must be ready to scream at this point. I, I'm losing hair <laughs> and I'm going gray. <laughs> oh, well, I can show you my pandemic roots. I started the, the pandemic with only mildly brown hair and it has been transformative <laughs> for us all. Mm -hmm. Great. 
Thank you, Anne. It doesn't appear to have there doesn't appear to have any other questions here in our in our chat, but I'll give it about a minute. Those were a lot of really great questions, and I always love it when people um, trust their fellow parents in their school communities enough to to be willing to say it's not easy because just having listened to some of the experiences of parents tonight, other parents will say it's not just my kid who has tuned out or who is being incredibly grumpy or who, uh, you know, wants to join the neighbor's family because they have better rules. It's happening in a lot of households right now. Hi, Anne. I'm just going to go to the chat here. I lost it. And we have a couple of questions here that have sure. come up. Oh, as a parent with depression and health issues, how can I find the energy to keep two teenagers focused on their schoolwork, along with dealing with the one's ADHD and the other's anxiety and depression? It really gets exhausting. It is exhausting. Yeah, for sure. And I think just um, being open about your own struggles, letting your kids know that everybody in the family is doing the best they can in a really difficult situation. And we have to sort of all work together on this and then figuring out like what actually really has to happen today or this morning, taking it in tiny little building blocks, because I know as somebody who had like a about a two or three year, year long severe clinical depression that when you're feeling really depressed, you hardly have any energy. Like you basically want to run your life from, you know, the couch or something because you're so physically exhausted and drained and, you know, it's hard to, to solve problems. So I think just like treat it as a family issue and um, cut it down to the bare essentials. Like, you know, um, maybe dishes stay in the sink longer than you'd like, or, you know, just asking other people who are resource people behind the scenes, even if they could just offer some support and encouragement via a Skype conversation with one of the kids or share some strategies. If you know other people who have um, ADHD, for example, and, and could provide support and strategies to your child remotely, that might be another option. Basically thinking, who is in my village? Who could be there for my family in some way right now? While also saying to yourself, this isn't gonna go on forever. So if we tread water and we manage not to sink, that's a good goal for today. Wonderful. And we will um, just end with a, this last question here. If you just give me a second, we got a few thank yous. I think I lost the screen. <laughs> uh, how do you get your 18 year old to advocate for their mental health themselves? They want to avoid it so it will go away. If I ignore it, it doesn't exist. Oh, I have been there. Um, when our daughter was uh, a teenager, um, she was having like severe mental health um, problems. At one point, she um, took too many Tylenols and ended up in the hospital having to have her stomach pumped. And she would not was not willing to recognize that she had a problem. And in fact, we took her for counseling at one point and she wore this t-shirt to counseling and it said, my problem is you. She wore that to sort of say to the counselor, I'm here against my will and stuff. So it took a long time to get that child to engage. But when she did, like once she made up her mind that she wanted something better for herself, it was like a light switch went on and, you know, a lot of progress was made in a very quick period of time. So I think it's just providing the um, the ongoing message of support and trying to keep the bus moving in the right direction even if you feel like you're the only person who's driving the bus and that you know if anything she's pushing it back or he or she is pushing it back in the other direction it is exhausting the other thing i would say get support for yourself there's an amazing group that has chapters all across ontario so these would be virtual meetings right now it's called parents for children's mental health so if you go to p C M H 
Ca, so Parents for Children's Mental Health. It's a network of peer support groups. And I can tell you peer support is magical. It's finding your people who've been through really challenging times and who can also share strategies and offer support and encouragement to you because you need support at least as much as your kids do. Thank you. And once again, we have a final question here. What would you suggest for parents concerned about the effect of all of this on their kids? Sense of self, sense of right. self-worth, uh, self-confidence in this. It's heartbreaking to watch them. Yeah. Some of those normal outlets to develop those like sports and extracurricular aren't options right now. Yeah. I think you can really empathize, but you can also still hold on to that sense of hope and optimism. And, you know, maybe it's because I studied history in university that I often think like this isn't the first time we've had to do a really hard thing as humans. And so we can look to people who've lived through other time periods and even people in our own communities who maybe are refugees from you know wartime or who have dealt with systemic racism their entire lives like those people should be the leaders for us in terms of the life lessons and the resilience and the teaching that they're in a position to do so helping your child to think of who could I turn to either personally or by reading something inspiring and not fake inspiring, but like genuinely rooted in life wisdom kind of inspiring in order to get that sense that yes, things are hard right now, but as humans, we can do hard things and we can come out the other side. And what matters the most is just doing it together, looking out for one another. Because I don't want it to just be that my family comes through this okay. I want it to be everybody's family comes through this to, to okay together. And I think that's the thing that will carry us through is just like those connections, those relationships, and that sense of none of us has to do this on our own. Thank you once again, and I know we have some thanks coming your way, uh, so I, I will uh, take a pause and before, however, I do that, I do want to let everybody know that uh, those who have participated this evening, uh, on behalf of GPIC, we have purchased a book for you. The uh, challenge will be uh, figuring out how we um, get those books to you. So we do believe we have a list of email uh, addresses and we will make sure that you're contacted so we can make uh, arrangements, even if we're able to get them to your home or to the school uh, where your child is located and move on from there so that they can get distributed appropriately. So I wanna thank GPIC for um, that gesture and uh, we really appreciate and uh, the opportunity to be able to distribute your your book uh, as we move forward. If there is an issue uh, where you've participated and you, you're missed, um, I'm going to call on our chair and I hope she doesn't mind if she puts her email in the chat box there. And um, if you haven't heard from us in about a week, uh, we'll make sure that we uh, make arrangements to get a book to you. So I'll take a pause now and I know we have some thank yous coming your way. Hi there, so I'm Susan Gibson. I'm one of the board of trustees. I'm also a parent of four. So I'd like to really thank you for your enlightening discussion today. I think the pandemic has been challenging for so many of us in so many ways. And I think bringing this large group together and talking about that and acknowledging the challenges has been fantastic. I did comment in the chat that I'm really looking forward to those brighter days that you mentioned and really looking forward to that appreciation that I might get in another decade from those <laughs> kids that sometimes I challenge. So I think a couple of the tips that really stick out for me is the fact that you were talking about being kind to ourselves. And I think that's really important, that piece of self-care that we give, because if we're not looking after ourselves, it's like putting the oxygen mask on in the airplane. It's hard to look after others. And I also really liked your comment about being kind to others. And as I was chatting with a friend as I was listening and sending a couple things that I really appreciated about her into the chat because I think that that's really important and if we can all do that and brighten somebody else's day because we don't know um, what other people are experiencing so I really like to thank you for taking the time to talk to us tonight this was a fantastic 
presentation, and I'm sure that there are many parents who are walking away tonight feeling a little bit lighter. Oh, thank you, Susan. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. I don't know if you can see the chat on the side, but lots of thank yous before we exit tonight. Oh, that's so nice to know. I'll, I'll catch up. I'll, I'll speed read. <laughs> <laughs> Good night, everyone. Thank you to everyone for coming and thank you, Anne, on behalf night, of everybody. GPEC as well. Bye. Sarah, are you still there? I am. Okay. All right. I didn't know if you're going to jump in or not. Sarah, are, are you okay if you do you mind um, just in case, um, you know, we issue your email here and then we can make sure we get a, a number of. Uh, yes, so I've put it in the chat. Okay. Um, I've got my email address in the chat. And I also have, um, I just put also two of the websites that she mentioned are also in the chat. So in case anybody is still listening and wants to look at those, um, if they didn't write them down. Oh, wonderful, I see it, thank you. Um, so what we will do is we'll have Catherine uh, see if she can download a list of participants and then we'll go from there. Perfect. Have a great night. Thank you.